um, you know, can give us an opportunity to talk in a little bit more detail about the about what the co op is and why it's important. And I like to think of those again as educational opportunities. So sometimes you'll get some hesitation, maybe from the Rotary or the Kiwanis group saying, hey, this we don't do sales pitches, you know, we're not that's not what we're about. And we can, you know, we can articulate to them that this isn't a sales pitch. We want to tell you what a co op is, how beneficial it is to the community and give you an update on where we are. That's all we're doing. And then at the end of that conversation, there'll be people in the audience who automatically raise their hand and say, oh, I want in. I, you know, how do I do this? How do I become an owner? Um, but I certainly think education is that foundational piece, Brooke, to kind of, to move people along that progression. So many of you have heard about, um, there's a marketing like um, timeline, I would say, I guess, for a lack of a better word, in terms of, our, our um, ability or interest in a product moves along a continuum. So the first time we hear about a product, you know, we're on this side of the continuum. And then someone else tells us about it, our friends sit, mention it, and you're like, oh, you know what, I saw that, I thought it was cool. Then someone else gets it and you're like, ooh, I do like that, it does look cool in person. And then seven times down that line, finally I buy the product or finally I sign up for that organiza organization. So keeping in mind that it may feel like we aren't moving these folks along, like maybe, maybe we've, we've been doing a lot of education and um, things aren't progressing maybe the way we'd like it to, but we have to keep in mind that it takes seven of those interactions before someone is on board with us. So keep at it, don't give up, um, even if it feels like folks aren't interested. I think what you just described is exactly um, the process that it was like for me. The first time I heard ah. about it, I didn't know what co-ops were. I knew of people's co-op in Ocean Beach, but that was really all I knew. And then it was all these little interactions that everybody else around the screen um, was part of that got me in. Nice, nice. So any suggestions on educating the community about co-ops during a pandemic? Yeah, yes, I think um, events like you're doing today, like this, this um, event, I think um, is, is a critical piece of that puzzle. Um, I think you could be um, reaching out, like I said, to those other organizations, Rotary Clubs, Book Clubs, um, and really just making yourself available. And, and that can be as simple as a Facebook post um, in, in a, or an article in your newsletter, like, hey, we are happy to talk with you about, or your group. Um, happy to schedule a time to ch jump on your Zoom call or attend your PTA meeting or whatever, wh whomever we can get in front of, let's get in front of. Um, I like to say that at this stage of the organizing game, um, that I didn't turn anyone down. If any, if someone wanted to hear from the co-op, I figured out a way to do it. Maybe, uh, maybe schedules didn't align this month, but for sure I can make it work that next month or find a way, you know, to get, um, to get in front of them. Um, I also think it's important to uh, address myths about co-ops. So I think sometimes people have preconceived notions about what a co-op is. And, and Brooke, you mentioned um, people's co-op there in, in Ocean Beach, which I think is awesome. And side note, my aunt's, was one of the founders of that co-op way back when in the 70s. Um, and, um, and she was the reason I was out there in the area visiting when I got to meet up with some of you all before. So anyways, um, I love that co-op. But um, talking about the myths associated with co-ops, like some people think that you have to be a member to shop at the store or that ownership is really expensive. And to some people, ownership is expensive, but it at least gives us the opportunity to address that question. And I know you guys have implemented some ways to make it more affordable for people. So that's an excellent opportunity to talk about those um, parts of your co-op or those offerings that you have. Um, in terms of education, I think um, I would strongly suggest that your newsletter on a monthly basis include at least one educational article. And I think that can be a co simply a co-op principle every month gets you seven months in, you know, I mean, that's, that's pretty simple. And then you can integrate other um, examples maybe of the co-op principles. And, and I think um, repetition when you're when you're talking about education is important um, because of this seven contact situation and the fact that we don't retain everything 
that we see or hear. So the more that we say and reiterate these messages, I think the more they'll hit home for um, folks who are paying attention to what we're doing. I, I would also say to expand your audience as well. You know, if you, um, if you aren't, and I'm, I, you know, here I am telling you I'm not on other social media channels, but I think if, um, if I were doing outreach work for a startup co-op, I certainly would be using all kinds of social media channels right now. Mm -hmm. And I'd be looking at ways to grow that audience. So um, looking at your numbers in terms of likes and, and, sh and then, you know, encouraging people like, hey, we're close to this number of likes, you know, can we get to that, you know, X benchmark by such and such a date expands your reach and then you're able to educate more people than the more reach that you have. Are things happening um, physically? Like, are you having farmer's markets or are those things not happening in your neck of the woods? No. Okay. They're not. There's, um, yeah, some restaurants have opened for outdoor dining. Um, I think some limited indoor dining. Yeah, we pretty much stopped all of our um, events. We were doing a produce box distribution. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as soon as COVID hit and people, you know, are trying to get access to, um, you know, healthy um, produce. Uh, but then that really, you know, as things started to open up and people felt more comfortable going back to the grocery store, those orders really declined. So we gotcha. did stop that. Okay, okay. Um, so speaking of, um, you brought up uh, physical places. So mm -hmm. next year, um, after we find a site, um, we'll be launching our capital campaign and we'll be asking owner members to further invest mm -hmm. um, by purchasing shares. What impact do you think that should and will have on our messaging and also our ownership growth? That's a great question. Um, so between now and then, you're going to want to grow your ownership base as, as much as you can because your pool of people uh, whom you can contact in terms of your capital campaign will be um, limited to that group. So the bigger we can get that group, the more chance of success that you'll have, first of all. Second of all, in terms of your membership or your messaging, I should say, Right now, it's never too early to start talking about your capital campaign with your ownership base. And I, in, in fact, um, when I'm even having initial conversations with individuals about the co-op, like to bring up how it's financed. Because how, what's your ownership share cost? $200. $200. dollars That was the same as ours at Green Top. So um, when you're when you're talking with someone, let's just say let's just pick a rough number out of the air that you need a thousand owners to open your store. So if you do the math, that's two hundred thousand dollars. Anybody who is uh, has got any business acumen are going to say it to you, well, you can't open a grocery store with two hundred thousand dollars. Where where's the rest of the money going to come from? And so I like to bring that up. I like to do that math for the individual, even if they don't have the acumen to ask. So. Oh yes, you know, so when we open our store, we're gonna have, um, we, we want to have a thousand owners. We need to have a thousand owners to be successful. And if you did that math at $200 a pop, you can, you know that $200,000 is probably not enough money to open a store. So the rest of the funds that we're gonna need come from capital from our ownership base. So you're gonna have a chance to invest more as we get further down the line. And then of course, we're gonna look for grants and bank loans and those kinds of things. So I talk about it very simply initially, but I do talk about it as soon as I get the chance to talk about it. Secondly, I'd work this into your communication strategy as well on a pretty regular basis. Um, if you're a year out from a capital campaign, I would once a month in your newsletter, there should be something about how a co-op is financed, um, what economic participation means, examples of co-ops who have just raised capital so that we're talking about this all along so that come capital campaign time this isn't a surprise and it will be a surprise to some people anyways because they haven't been paying attention like we have been paying attention we can't avoid that but the more people we can educate along the way about how we finance the store the more uh, participation that we'll have once we get to that point Great. Thank you. Well, Katie, I know we have just about five more minutes of your time. Um, does anybody else on the call have any questions they want to ask Katie about some of the stuff we've gone over? You know, I wanted to suggest, uh, since Tara can't see us and she's on the phone, that we uh, give her a chance to ask any questions she might have first. Uh, Tara, did you have any questions? Yeah. 
<clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, actually, so I am just so new, um, and I would like somebody, I'd like <laughs> to give somebody an opportunity to just educate me because I'm just brand new, finding out about this, and, and I'm interested in becoming an owner or a member. And, like, would someone just kind of educate me? Sure, sure. Well, so we are, you know, a grassroots community effort to increase access to healthy food in Imperial Beach and surrounding communities. And uh, we realized that um, the types of grocery stores that, you know, we wanted to come in, you know, things like Trader Joe's or Sprouts weren't going to come to our community. Uh, IB is basically a food desert and we have a lot of liquor stores and fast food restaurants, but not a lot of other uh, shopping uh, opportunities. So we started organizing and doing research on co-ops and just fell in love with this model. You know, it's, it's community driven, you know, everybody gets one vote, uh, you know, and everybody, you know, we build that community support where, and um, then we open a store that will have, you know, a greater selection of environmentally uh, friendly food and products, food from local farms and local businesses. And it will reflect uh, what our owner members want and what our community wants. So the kinds of foods that you know, you'd like to be able to buy, the kinds of products and services, uh, that's what our store will offer. And we get it built kind of like we, you know, um, Katie was talking about by people investing initially $200. Um, and then you become an owner member. When the store opens, you'll be eligible for uh, rebates based on how much you shopped and owner discounts and um, yeah, it's great. I don't know. Have you ever shopped at OB Peoples or been to another food co-op? Yeah, I'm a member there. What's okay. the difference for you all about uh, an owner and a member? What's the difference? You know, it's, it's, that's a really good question. It's interchangeable, actually. Some co-ops call their owners members and other people call them owners. So we've tried to emphasize that ownership part of it, that, you know, this is we're all owners together and we have a say in the store. Um, you know, but um, other like co-op uh, businesses like credit unions are cooperatives and they call people members. Uh, so it's just different terminology. Because uh, for me, that's confusing. Just so you know, um, I, I, I think it'd be great to have it, you know, owner slash member or owner only or member because it's confusing because e even when I can't remember her name, who your guest speaker, she was she was addressing um, the campaign, you know, two owners, separate emails to the members as if they're two separate things. And so that was confusing for me. That's a really good point. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, that's part of our communication. So it sounds like, yeah, we need to be clearer and more consistent on the terminology we use. So what I'm, what I'm hearing is it actually is the same thing. The owner and the member are the one and the same entity, yeah? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Now that's clear for me, but that wasn't just to give feedback. <laughs> yeah. No, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Also, um, <clears throat> just curious. Um, so I started way back when um, you know, with Wall the Willow because Mel Lyons is an old friend of mine, mm -hmm. and that's been you know m my interest in supporting his endeavor. And what's his? Um, um, association now with you all he's just he's helping or is he really part of it or what what's what's yeah mel is, yeah mel is very much a part of it he was one of our earliest people to come on board um with the co-op and join the co-op and um mm -hmm. he is a very active volunteer so he serves on our steering committee which is um they're kind of, for us, they're like advisory committee. So they're very much like board members, but they don't have a vote. So he attends most of our board meetings. Um, he does, he volunteers to do graphic design for us. He's done, um, helped us. Um, he did a lecture education. He does some education for us. So he's very much involved. We're in contact with Mel every week. <laughs> awesome. Okay, thank you. I appreciate so knowing that. that. Thank yeah, you. and so are you going to do CSA, or are you going to just really have a, like your, your aim is to have a storefront maybe by next year or something like that? Yeah. We are going to have a grocery store. Yeah, we want a grocery okay. store for our community so you can get the good food that you want anytime. Um, and we hope to um, identify our location by June of next year. That's our timeline. Got you. Got yeah. you. And is it going to be mostly organic, all organic? Just curious. 
that's going to be up to our owners. So we um, uh, we will be having those discussions with the owner members about, you know, what do you want? What's our product mix going to look like? And how much do you want to be organic? How much do you want to be local? So it'll be very much customized to our community. Got it. Thank you. Sure. No, that. thank, thank you, Sarah. Um, Okay. And I'm probably going to um, pop off now. I just thank you very much and uh, and good luck. And, and I'll, um, uh, okay, let me just ask this. If I did want to become a member, um, and ha how do I do that? Yeah, Tara, so you can go to our website at suncoastmarket.coop for co-op. Um, okay. And it's really easy to do it online. Um, if you have any issues or you have questions, you want to have additional conversation, you can also use our contact form to email us there. And we'd be happy okay. to, you know, have a phone call with you or, you know, communicate via email to help you through the process. And we hope you'll okay. join. Really, it's a wonderful okay. project. <laughs> yeah, and then, thank you. And lastly, just um, what would I tell if I'm encouraging others? What would I tell them? It's like, there's no product. There's no store yet. This is just... Um, um, uh, a campaign to create this for next year, right? But there's no, there's not going to be any products available to them, right? Right, right. Yeah. Okay. And maybe, okay. Maybe Katie, yeah. Yeah. I, I, is there something that you would say, Katie? Would yeah, you? I would. I would say, Tara, thanks. That's a great question. What I tell my friends and neighbors is that um, I, I was getting in on this now because I want to bring this store to the community and I, and I want to um, be part of that but I also wanna be part of that community. So although we don't have a store open right now, um, Suncoast Market has a thriving community with um, lots of you know, great people interested in the same- oh, Yeah, how many members right? actually are in the community now? What, Shirley? We have 578. Oh, yeah, no. I like that because I, I can say that, yeah, we wanna bring this to the community and so far we have 578. Yeah. Yeah, I like yeah. that. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a big number. That says a lot. Yeah, that's a big it, number. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we um, try to update it. Right now, we're currently updating it every week, so it is updated on our face on our site, our website. Mm -hmm. What's the current like um, weekly um, um, increase of members? Just curious. Well, that's a hard question to answer because since the virus has hit, it's been fluctuating anywhere from two to 10. Uh, before that, we were getting about 20, at least 20 a month um, new owners. Uh, we did get quite a few in April when we were doing the um, produce boxes. So we got about 14 new owners at that time. Uh, right now, in the month of October, we've already got uh, received 10 new owners. So we're really on track for our 31 owners for 31 days. Well, perfect. Great. And you're not offering the produce boxes now? No. We stopped. We were doing them and with uh, specialty produce, and we were not getting enough uh, people to be uh, wanting to do the produce boxes. I believe it's because people were going to work and they were getting out more, so they weren't ordering them. And we had to have a minimum of 50 a week and we weren't meeting that for them to deliver the boxes to us. Got it, okay. Thank you so much for all these specific oh. questions. I appreciate it a lot. <laughs> Thanks so for joining us. us. Yeah. 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 Thank you. All right, that's of, of everything. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Katie, do you have time for one or two more questions or do you need I, to run? No, I do have time, but I would like to take a, can, does anyone mind if I take a screenshot of our call and post on yeah. social media? Oh no, please. You know what? And okay. in the middle of it, I started recording. I hope nobody minded. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to take that right now just so okay, I have I'm it. Put my video okay. back on. Okay. Not that I want people to see me, but. <laughs> okay, everyone smile and look pretty. Let's say hi. <laughs> One, two, three. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Uh -huh. um, but yes, I'd be happy to take another question. 
You know, Katie, one thing I was talking to Shannon with this morning was about, um, you know, our numbers are, have gone down so much with COVID. You know, we were looking at our budget yesterday and we, you know, we were anticipating projecting 405 owners this year. Mm -hmm. And it looks like we'll maybe get like 160. And so that's really like, you know, hurt our bottom line in terms of mm -hmm. the money that we're bringing in. Mm -hmm. And so we're wondering, you know, we're getting so close to being in a position where we might announce a site, mm -hmm. you know, we're looking at 700, having a goal of 700 owners and that being in June. Do you think there's any advantage to maybe we could do a letter of intent earlier and not really be um, if we find a really good location, the place that we want? Mm -hmm. Is there a benefit to, you know, could we see like a big increase in ownership once we announce a site? Um, say we did that in March instead of June or something. Could we mm -hmm. potentially, ex you know, expect to see a, a big increase in interest? <clears throat> we'll see more real to people. That's a, that's a great question. And um my personal experience at Green Top Grocery as the outreach manager, when we announced our site, we, we were told that when you announce a site, you'll see a jump in ownership. People will see that this is concrete and they'll be interested and they'll sign on. That didn't really happen for us. Mm -hmm. We projected about 150 owners would join us that month and maybe uh, we had a normal month, I'd say. I, I don't have the, the stats in front of me, but I'd say maybe 30 30 or 40, maybe slightly higher than average month. So it did not, it didn't give us the boost that we thought it would. I would say the co-ops that I've worked with since then would probably tell you similar things. I think uh, the location has the potential to turn some people on and turn some people off. So mm -hmm. that's important to keep in mind. You're not gonna make everyone happy. It's not gonna be in everyone's neighborhood. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, I think it's, it's helpful. It, it's usable to, um, to grow your ownership base when you announce your site. Will it grow as much as you want it to? I, I would tend to believe that it's not what we would like it to be. Great. Thank you. It's helpful. Yes. And I, and I hear you in terms of, um, ownership numbers being down during COVID, because of COVID. Um, but I'd encourage you to, to, uh, to keep at it uh, because people need, people need community now more than ever. And so, um, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not privy to all of the great things that you're doing. I'm sure you're doing lots of good things, but, but perhaps amping up our virtual presence um, or virtual events might kind of booster those numbers a little bit. We were um, planning to put up a thermometer to show the community our growth. Nice. So that is something that would put us out there a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great idea. Um, and you'll have a thermometer when you launch your capital campaign as well. Um, you'll, so you'll have, right now you can be um, documenting ownership growth and eventually documenting dollars. I think that's, um, that's a great option. And um, do you think that'll be like physically visible in the community or is it this something that you'll use in graphics online or on your website? Um, Annie, you want to, you want to, you're the one that's doing the banner. Um, it's going to be physical. Yeah, it's going to be out <clears throat> in the main walking area of our town. It's a pretty large sign, but I yeah. see us using it as social media as well in awesome. different forms. Sure. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think um, documenting it's, it's, um, it's growth, you know, like getting out there with a marker or however it is that you're updating it and taking a quick video of somebody doing that or a picture of someone doing that. Um, that creates energy and excitement. I like it. I think that's, that's positive. And, and, I, and I would encourage you to do something similar for your 30, 31 owners in 31 days, having some kind of visual that documents your progress. Um, you know, I, I, I can't remember, are there pumpkins associated with your 31 owners in 31 days? I know another co-op is doing something with a pumpkin giveaway. No. No. Okay. Well, anyways, it's, it's Halloween time. So you could have 31 pumpkins on the screen and fill them in with orange paint as you, you know, orange color as you 
gets closer to 31 owners or something like that, or, you know, have a calendar with one on every day or something like that so that people see the movement and the progress and they're like, oh yeah, we're getting close. I should do it now. Great idea. Yeah. Great idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. Fun. I have a question. Yes, Robin. And I'm not sure if you can answer it. <laughs> so in the community in, in, in South Bay where we're at, there are African Americans and I find it very hard to reach them because when you discuss co-op with them, all they think is it's a bunch of white people who are mm. hippies. Yes. Not, not they're not realizing that we used to have black co-ops long mm -hmm. ago, and they were kind of, you know, taken away. But so my problem is because I'm trying to reach the different ethnic ethnics of the people. Yes. How how to really touch that? What do we need to do anything different with their advertisement or their marketing or what you know? Because I've shared things of history of black co-ops, but mm -hmm. it's just really hard to reach them. Okay. Yes. Thank you for asking this question, Robin. And I I um, am in no way an expert on this, and I would say. I, that is one of the things I, I didn't do as well as I could have done as an outreach manager is reach people who didn't look like me. Um, so I'm trying to do better about that. And I don't, I, I attended the, um, there was a conference last week, National Cooperative Business Alliance had a national conference and I sat in on some racial um, equity kinds of sessions that were really kind of really eye opening for me. What was most eye-opening for me is that when we talk about the history of cooperatives, I have only been told about the Rochdale or Rockdale, I don't even know how you say that, uh, co-op as the founder of the cooperative movement in the United States. Well, that's baloney. I mean, that is just totally not true. Uh, there have been indigenous people and Africans having co-ops for centuries. Um, so one thing I thought about in, when I was going through these sessions, Robin, is that I did these info sessions about co-ops, like co-op 101. What is a co-op and why should I care? And maybe something like that would, would translate to another community, like black co-ops, why should I care? Or the history of black co-ops, why should I care? And kind of creating, an, uh, and this could be done virtually online as well, um, some uh, an interactive kind of um, opportunity for us to tell the real story because I think we're missing out on such an opportunity to bring more people to the table and there's such valuable history there so that's one idea I have Robin um, I think I think um, demonstrating with our policy could be another way that we um, can grow our base in terms of our bringing more people to the table. And some things I have done, I've seen other co-ops do is early on create a hiring policy where, you know, we want to hire X number of people from X radius of the store. So we, this is a neighborhood store founded, you know, staffed by neighbors, owned by neighbors, kind of a, a thing. You could also create a policy on diversity in your hiring um, that, that could include that, that physical radius, but could also be more broad. I also would like to see more co-ops take a, a policy on Black Lives Matter issues, you know, and create physical, um, not necessarily physical, but, but policy-driven um, processes for our store and then talk about them. You know, that yes, yes, I understand when, you know, when I'm talking to, you know, people of color, I might say, I know that it feels like only white hippies shop at the store, but listen, there are, we've got a history here of rich roots that, uh, and we need you to be part of that. And we want you to help us tell that story. So I could talk for days on this and I'd love to talk with you more. I'd want to try to make it better. Okay, thank you. You're I'm welcome. Good. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing, Robin. Yeah. Any other final thoughts or questions? Anything you want to say um, 
Katie? And you know what? I wrote something down when someone else was talking and I wrote down education. So that doesn't really help me. Um, <laughs> what was I going to say about education? Oh, I know what I was going to say. One thing I have seen other co-ops doing, um, and not even co-ops, but other organizations doing rather successfully in terms of virtual education is providing something of interest to folks. So I've seen wine, virtual wine tastings and virtual honey tastings, and you could even do coffee or chocolate. Um, and we did these, uh, I've done all of these kinds of things in person, but you can also do them virtually. So if you set up an event where you could limit it to a certain number of people, let's say 10 people or something, you can coordinate you know, the, the physical pieces of the puzzle, the chocolate or the honey or the wine. Um, and then, and there are some organizations, I think there are some companies, um, uh, wineries that will do this for you. Like they, this, this is what they, they want people to, to, um, buy their product and we need to, to tell our story. So if we can spend a half an hour tasting wine and a half an hour talking about the co-op, it's kind of a win-win for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, so those kinds of things I think are, are an interesting way to kind of, uh, give people something creative and interesting and at the same time build the co-op. So that's the only other thought I had. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. We did do a wine tasting early on, but I think we could do more of that, you know, and branch out, like you said, the honey tastings. Yeah. It and you makes could, it fun. Yeah. Yeah. It could, it, it could, and you could even highlight farmers. So uh -huh. apples or, you know, who knows what else you could, you know, right. Coordinate with a farmer. So they're, they're telling their farm story and you're telling the co-op story and it, works well together, so. That's a great idea. Lydia, did you have any questions you wanted to ask Katie before we go? You're on mute. No, oh, sorry. sorry, thank <laughs> you. I'm good, I'm, I'm a fly on the wall. <laughs> well, I think it's so, I also wanted to thank you, Kim, for inviting other co-ops. That's very cooperative. So cool. <laughs> well, yeah. And I didn't know if they'd all had a chance to meet you before, you know, at up and coming or, you know, otherwise. So I wanted to make sure that they had a chance to experience in person your great energy and the expertise that you bring. And um, yeah. And Lydia, I don't know if you've checked out, uh, you know, Katie's website, but she does. You want to talk a little bit about the consulting that you do, Katie? Yeah, sure. I can, I can talk with, uh, with you briefly about that. Yes, I, I specialize in, in primarily three areas, ownership growth, capital campaigns, and hiring. So typically folks in this realm of, of, de of development are hiring their first staff person or hiring a campaign coordinator. So those kind of all tie together. So um, most of the, the bulk of my work, I shouldn't say the bulk of my work, I would, about half of my work is um, um, capital campaigns and half of it is outreach and, and hiring. Um, and so um, happy to help with both of those. I will tell you one cool thing though, and I mentioned this to Kim, I am working on some technology to help uh, with capital campaigns. So there's a lot of data that goes into a capital campaign and right now every co-op is managing that data on their own. Um, I provide some, when, when we work together, I provide some parameters and so, like a spreadsheet and some things we can use and tailor to fit your needs, but uh, everybody's doing their own thing. And a spreadsheet has limitations in terms of data integrity and access issues, privacy issues. And so I'm, I'm in the process right now of developing some, some technology that will solve some of those problems. So hopefully that will become part of the uh, piece of the puzzle of what I'm offering uh, rather shortly here. I'm hoping we'll have something ready to go in a month or two. Yeah, that's exciting. I'm sure that'll be a great tool, Katie, because I know we run into that all the time with our spreadsheets and issues and yes, <laughs> sharing yes. information. Yeah. yeah. And the, my thought process, my big dream is that this tool starts as a owner management tool. So you could manage you know, your ownership process would be managed through this tool. Oh. And then that would transition into your, you use the same tool to process your capital campaign. We just add a few bells and whistles to it. Mm -hmm. And then eventually the same data, if not the same tool would be used in your point of sale system. So it'd wow. be all seamless, uh, kind of a seamless transition, hopefully, but 
that's kind of the pipe dream. I, the first two stages of the puzzle are a little more concrete. The point of sale system is going to take a little more work, but we're getting there. <laughs> awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds like it's really needed. Yeah, I think so. I could have used it. I know when I was doing yeah. the work you all are doing. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> okay. Any final thoughts or questions? Um, so, well, we thank you so much, Katie, for making this time. We so appreciate it, it you making the time and appreciate you. And um, you've given us a lot of good food for thought. And uh, thank you for being here today. Yeah. You are welcome. Thank you for asking me. And I'll keep watching and, and rooting for 31 owners this month. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Katie. All right. Thanks, take Katie. care, guys. Everybody. Thank you. Bye. See ya. Bye.